Hey, it's another night shoot. I'm forgetting to do videos until late in the day most times now. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Sumerian September. I'm not going to do a lot of events this month, but I did want to uh, do this one. This is the event where, started by Michael K. Vaughn, where people read Conan books. Specific, specifically this year, the Conan pastiche novels. Specifically, the Conan pastiche novels written by, edited and organized by Elspeth de Camp in the 70s, which is the way a lot of people my age and even like a decade younger, like Michael K. Vaughan, first encountered these books. And um, I'm not reading any of those either, any of those 12 books. I won't go through the whole history of it. Anybody interested in this has probably already watched many of the other uh, Sumerian September videos so I don't need to belabor it but I did read one of the books that Sprague de Camp and Lynn Carter wrote after their original 12 and this is the first book I bought after after uh, in celebration of my finishing the 100 book challenge I this was 75 cents on Kindle which is why I got this one Conan the Liberator by Elspreg de Camp and Lynn Carter, uh, which is not very good. Spoiler alert. And I finished it a couple days ago. I haven't done a video on it because I was trying to figure out how to organize my thoughts on, on different things about what I'm going to do with the channel going forward in terms of, uh, of you know, participating in events and, and things. Um, and it sort of fit in with some other ideas I had, but I didn't get them organized. So when I read these these DeCamp and Carter books as a kid, now these were the original twelve were mixed in with 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 the true Conan Robert E. Howard stories, and sort of reorganized, re-edited. Plus DeCamp and sometimes alone, and sometimes with uh, Lynn Carter. And a couple with another guy named uh, Nieborg, Bjorn Nieborg, I think, wrote new stories to fill in gaps. Uh, this is very lucrative for everyone involved. Um, so after, even after they did that first set of 12, which, which originally, I guess, was going to be eight books, with mostly hired material, then they wrote a few more books and slipped them in between. Then they, they kept writing them. And this is one of these that was after the original 12. Uh, as I, I'm really not surprised they sell it for 75 cents now. It's not good at all. It's timeline. Uh, it is Conan about the age of 40. It is right before he becomes king of Aquilonia. So he's a general. It's a military novel. He's... Um, So it's a military campaign. When I was a kid, I you know I just thought, we just thought, and I get this from you know like Grammaticus's uh, reviews and uh, Michael K. Vaughan and Steve Donahue and, and other people who are you know versed in this. Uh, you know this is just what we had to put up with, and but at the time I think I was probably only eleven or twelve when I. When I got this series, I got them in, I had to order them special at a bookstore, Walden Books in Reno, Nevada, where I grew up. I could only find a couple of them, but I was able to get the bookstore to order, special order all of them in British paperbacks. I think it was, I think it was Sphere was the publisher that republished them in England. So when I was reading them, they were, they were in between uh, American publishers, because it switched publishers a couple times. Um, they were nice looking editions, they're all black spine, you know, the, the Frazetta, Frazetta covers and that. They also did one of King Cull. So there was 13 books in all. The King Cull uh, book was sort of greenish, sort of olive green, I think. I wonder if, I didn't look for those, but uh, I haven't seen many people talk about those British editions. Anyway, they're very nicely made. There was, there was a lot of time when I was reading science fiction 
as a as a very young man as a boy but a lot of the good stuff even by Americans was only being published in Britain um, so I was happy to have them I had gotten into Conan from I'm pretty sure from the comics I don't think I would have just found these books on their own I might have through uh, through reading Edgar Rice Burroughs but So there was no, at this time, there was no way just to get the Howard stories. I'm going into the whole history of it, like I said I wasn't going to anyway, but. And I read a lot of these two authors. I read a lot of books edited by Lynn Carter. I was very into Sword and Sorcery. By the time I found Conan, it might have even been through Michael Moorcock's, you know, various writings in his prefaces and things of his own books, or maybe Fritz Leiber's that I heard about Conan in the first place. It might have been that way. Or it might have been the Roy Thomas Marvel comics. Uh, I remember I remember Brian had the Savage Sword of Conan. I've kept it almost my whole life. I sold it a couple of years ago for a hundred bucks or so. Um, in very bad condition, but I, I, I love that comic. I had a few of the, of the other Savage Sword of Conan, Conan issues too. It was very spotty buying comic books in Reno at the time, you would just not get every issue distributed wherever you were. There was no place I could rely on that would have like, like for example, every month it would have Fantastic Four, for example, or, or even Batman or whatever. They were always really spotty, so I could never really collect a full run of anything, but I was happy to get what I could. Um, and so there was no judgment around these at the time even though I always struggled with Lynn Carter especially because he was a terrible writer and I didn't know that there were terrible writers at the time. That's how young I was. I just knew that there were writers that I liked more than others and I just struggled to get through his books. It not even occurred to me that it might not be my fault. I just assumed there was something I didn't understand about Lynn Carter because his name was everywhere. He was very popular because of his he edited the uh, the Ballantine, um, I think it was Ballantine, adult fantasy line, which brought a lot of classic fantasy books back into print. You know, in kind of in kind of reaction to uh, Tolkien becoming popular for the first time in the early seventies. Should I stop for that siren? Um, and he wrote a sword and sorcery series, or rather he edited a sword and sorcery series called Flashing Swords, which I got through Science Fiction Book Club. Um, they're very short, they're like 200 pages, they have novellas, short, or novelettes by different sword and swords, like they might have a, pretty, pretty sure they usually had a Fritz Leiber story in them. They would have a brand, uh, not Brian McMorn, uh, who am I thinking of? John Jakes, who, oh, Brack the Barbarian. I think they would have some of his stories in there. Different ones, and they would always have a Lynn Carter story about his character Thongor. It's unreadable. And he had, he was very much a, he was, he was a student, Lynn Carter was a student of old pulps. He, and he went about, his writing career was basically, His, his editing career is basically about bringing stuff to the fore, which was great. And his series were all, almost always, you know, pastiches of the stuff that I liked. Or, like, not pastiches, not technically pastiches, but imitations of the stuff I like. Like, the Thongor was his Conan character. Uh, Callisto I, um, was his kind of like John Carter character is a guy who ends up going to the moon, Callisto, uh, and having, you know, planet, sword and planet adventures, a la Burroughs hero, and then he had a character called, and this was the worst, this one I couldn't even get through, it was like Zarkon of the Unknown, I think, which was kind of like his Doc Savage uh, slash uh, Avenger character, like his pulp hero character, and they're just not a strong writer, but here and there he wrote some interesting things in this Conan series. The other writer, Elspreg DeCamp, I guess I'm not going to talk about Robert Howard much. 
um, which probably is is a shame because he's a much better writer. But I really liked uh, Elspeth de Camp. He was a writer I read for quite a while on after even reading these Conan books. I, I don't know if I encountered him separately or not before, but he wrote fantasy. He wrote science fiction. He wrote a lot of short stories. He was really in that sort of sort of main pantheon of male science fiction writers of the 50s and 60s. He wrote, he wrote a lot of pop science books too, like about archaeology and things. He's a friend of... He's in... If you've ever read the Asimov uh, mystery series, The Tales of the Black Widowers, he is one of the characters in that series. Uh, it was inspired by him. The Black Widowers are these uh, this group of smart guys who solve mysteries in New York City. One of them based on Elspeth de Kim, one of them based on Asimov himself and others. Um, which which are good books to read. Fun, uh, like Locked Room and uh, crime mystery stories, often with like sort of a science sort of uh, background to them. And these guys sit around in sort of a PG Woodhouse fashion and in their armchairs in the club and, and, and solve these mysteries intellectually. And they're good. So I was always well aware of Elspeth de Camp and I liked his books, like Less Darkness Fall and stuff. They always had a, 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 a pretty good sense of humor about them, as I remember. At least the ones I liked more. And he didn't bring much of that to his Conan work at all. Uh, my main problem with this book pr particularly, but with any of them, is they were not... I, I don't know about Lynn Carter. Lynn Carter might have been a Conan fan. He's just not that good a writer. But Elspeth de Camp, I, I feel like, was not a Robert Howard fan at all, even though he wrote uh, what I'm told is a highly inaccurate um, biography of, of Robert Howard. I, I th He's... To me, and I could be wrong, I'm sure there's more scholars out there who have who have different views, but to me it seems like it was just very opportunistic, you know, much like James Blish would be writing the the Star Trek book adaptions, you know, the, the short story adaptions of the original series episodes just from the scripts, had never seen the show, it was just a job to do. That's how I. That's the thing I get about Elspeth de Camp and some of the things he said, even at the time when he was like, when he was taking other Howard stories that did not feature Conan that were not story were not even sword and sorcery stories were just straight adventure pulp adventure stories without any supernatural element, and he was just you know changing the the main character's name to Conan moving it from the 1900s or, or the Middle Ages or wherever to the Hyperborean Age uh, or the Hyperborean Age um, and then just grafting on some, some monsters and some wizards. You know, his justification for that, I remember I had an interview or something with him at one point. I had a fanzine, I think, that had some and there's probably, and of course they always write, they always fill out the word count and all these things with uh, their all their prologues and afterwards and notes about how they saved Howard. But he would, he would, uh, he would dismiss it saying, well, you know, Howard's heroes are all of a piece. Anyway, you know, they're all pretty much Conan in different guises and it's, that's not really true because I think people realize now, especially that Conan was his masterpiece, Howard's masterpiece, and it might have been, it would be so different, you know, he, how old was he when he killed himself? 30, 36, 39, something like that? Very young, insanely young, and probably 30. And he was already moving out of the Conan sphere because, you know, Weird Tales was his main market at that time, it didn't pay quite as well. You know, it's beloved and remembered now because it was such a quirky magazine, but it was not one of the bigger circulation magazines. It was not one of the bigger, uh, certainly not one of the higher paying magazines, and they, and they sometimes were quite late on their payments. So he was trying to move more into westerns and 
spicy things. And who knows if he would have gone back to Howard at, to Conan at some other time or, or done some other uh, type of fantasy work. We just don't know because he died so tragically young. You know, but then again, uh, you know, it's all... It's it's all one. We don't know if he'd he what if he'd have been a different kind of person who managed tragedy and managed life better. He might not have written the same kind of things at all. So who knows? But it's important to remember how extremely young Howard was when he died, and of course he wasn't married and he didn't have children, so he didn't have any descendants later. His, he had a literary ex executor, how do you say it? Executor, I think that's how you say it, you know, who Glenn Lord, who kind of took over this franchise. And, you know, I sometimes wonder about that if, if what if, uh, you know, because the way Howard, the way Conan came down to us at this time was just really disrespectful of his, of his legacy. Um, you know, I didn't even think about it because by this time Howard had been dead. What by when they started publishing these in the seventies, these Lancer, I think they were originally Lancer, but these DeCamp Carter books, it would have been like forty years, thirty or forty years since Howard's death. And of course, the fans, you know, dedicated pulp fans who had uh, kept him alive through known press editions and that, but these were the first attempt to make them popular. And there was no, you know, there was no care given to correct, you know, to, to corrected texts or, or his, or what Howard's vision would have been because he never wrote the stories in order. He wrote them very much out of order. So what I would like to do, and I don't know if there's an edition that, that does this, um, of course, yeah, I could just buy the, the complete Conan and, and just read the by. I'm, I'm sure somewhere in there's a concordance or a list of by uh, estimated composition date. I'd rather read them in that order. I like to read stuff in the in the order people wrote it rather than, you know, its timeline, its internal timeline. You know, because one of the first stories, if not the first story published, I think was Conan was a king. Right, and then in later stories, it shows him in the middle of his life as a as a pirate, or, or in his youth as a as a as a thief. You know, he jumps around a lot, and it would be interesting to read the stories. I never read them straight through in that order. You know, including the fragments and everything. Some stuff's probably hard to date, and just see what how. Howard developed the character himself over those very short amount of years that he was really writing about this one character. I think there's 18 stories or something like that. Um, I'm, I'm not, I don't even remember now if that includes the few that were found, manuscripts that were later published in fanzines first. And then, of course, there's all this other stuff, you know. Uh, but at the time, I didn't think anything of it when I was, I was reading those. I just accepted that this is the way the stories were brought out, and it was good to have more Conan stories, and it was good that someone organized them into a life history. So if you read those Sprague de Camp books, those de Camp Carter editions, starts out with Conan as a kid, uh, all the way through the end, um, Conan's a king, and then later he's a king with a son, and then there's, like, there's a lot of the Conan, a lot of that series I remember, Conan's quite old, which is odd. I think they, you know, they, they didn't time it that well. They didn't know how many books they were going to be able to squeeze out. So a lot of the later books are almost all to Camp and Carter. And they've already got to the point in chronologically where Conan's a king. So they have all these post-king stories uh, with his son and all that. And, and But reading this, you know, and I dip into Robert Howard every so often. Uh, I haven't done like a full reread, but... The first thing you notice about this book is it's missing, I don't even know what it is, it's missing the world, it's not even just missing Conan, it's missing Conan and it's missing the world, and yet it's allegedly a Conan story, but it doesn't have the, I don't know what the word, I've been trying to think of the word for a couple of days, the fecundity, I guess, 
of the world of 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 Conan's world. It's just not as rich. It's not as I don't know, you wouldn't even say sexy or it's not as sensual or anything. It's just sort of quotidian and uh workmanlike and you know, this was a job they had to do so they could squeeze their own own work in around it. You know, it seems to be this is what I was trying to get at the other day in some of my Star Trek videos, and people asked me why I th why I thought, in my opinion, of the more recent Star Trek past or Star Trek novels seem to be better written and written with more care and interest than the earlier ones I read. And as a, as a caveat, I haven't read nearly any. You know, I've read maybe eight, ten Star Trek novels total by this time. But it seems to me the earlier ones were either written by... Some of them were written by pretty well-established authors, but they didn't seem to be Star Trek fans necessarily, or they were written by fans based on, you know, the limited mythology at that relatively limited mythology at that time of the seventy what was it, 79 episodes of the original series or whatever. And I also, I have the feeling maybe that the publishers at the time were uh, much more strict about what they could and what they would let writers change and not change and what they would um, let writers do. Whereas now we have this generation of writers that have been doing them for over the past 30 years, ever since Next Generation came up, who grew up on Star Trek, who grew up in a world where there was already Star Trek novels. So they, uh, they see it more as a legitimate subgenre, I guess, instead of just uh, work for hire or a fantasy. It's just like, you can write these books now. Uh, I think there's people who really are just happy to do that. Uh, I don't know now. It's probably fallen off a uh, lot now. And it also seems there's more uh, leeway to create more elaborate stories and more uh, character-driven stories and more freedom to create new characters that are not part of the series but that sometimes continue from book to book. And so a lot more creativity and a lot of uh, more love go into these books, I feel like. Whereas the others had to be, no, this is an adventure based on a 1960s TV show and we only know these certain things about these characters and we don't want to stray too much because we don't want to upset the the fans. But now they've realized, you know, over the years, trial and error, that the people want, you know, bigger stories. They want the world filled out. Uh, how does that relate to Conan? I can't even remember what I was talking about. Okay, so, you know, and there's a lot of later Conan pastiches too are probably just people and fans that probably grew up on these uh, DeCamp and, and Carter editions as as much as Conan and had their own ideas how to improve them, but DeCamp and Carter, it doesn't seem like they had that much respect for, for Howard. So they, you know, they took stories that were I, you know, and it, may, it might have been a slippery slope. I could see taking a story that's half done and finishing it. And then, you, you know, they get a little like, and they, then maybe here's a little something that's alluded to a story. So let's write a story about what, how Conan got to this, this point in his career. We could fill that in and like, hey, this story is this, uh, about this, uh, about El Barak, the, the, you know, the Lawrence of, Olivia, Lawrence, uh, of Arabia type character that Howard wrote is a pretty good adventure story, so let's just, but nobody wants that because everybody wants just Conan, Conan, Conan. Um, so we'll just change the character's name, but, oh, but they're super nuts. Nice. Oh, we'll just add some, some wizards and some tentacles or whatever. And then, you know, from that point, they're just like, we'll just write our own novels. And they were able to do this because Howard died so young and left his legacy and his legacy was left in the hands of people who 
uh, wanted to make money off it. I'm not saying that was their only goal. I'm sure they wanted stuff. In the, but I, I think about, you know, why wasn't this done with, with Burroughs? You know, Burroughs wrote a lot more books, but, and he lived a lot longer, and he had a family, and he was a very successful author in his lifetime. Howard was semi-successful. He was making a good living, but he wasn't like a, he wasn't his own entity. He wasn't his own uh, corporation like Edgar S. Burroughs was or like uh, Earl Stanley Gardner was, people like that, you know, at the time. And so, you know, they had apparatus in place, but I could see that if, say, Burroughs had died earlier, um and had not had a family and not had, uh, you know, put all the rights together and all the, you know, and everything that they needed to have in place to have it go on that, you know, if someone had gotten a hold of it, they might have been like, well, let's let's make some more Tarzan books. Um, you know, and, and those things have been tried a few times now and again, but they have to be authorized by the, by the borough's estate, which, you know, it's, over over the decades, has been pretty careful to to control Burroughs' name and characters. But you know, you could see them taking like a less popular series. Let's well, let's take uh, these two westerns that Burroughs wrote, uh, and let's uh, let's set them on Mars. Let's just change them to Mars and and make the character. John Carter and make the Indians into Tharks, I, I mean, or something like that. You could see where that might happen if people were like, we've only got 11 Mars novels, let's, let's, let's get some other stuff here that's going, a less popular series. Let's change the Mars series to Venus. I mean, the Venus series to Mars or whatever, or let's take some of these adventure stories and make them into Tarzan stories. Uh, you could see how it would happen, but it didn't happen. You just never know what horrible things could have been tried with other authors' work. I always think about, and I'm not a Stephen King fan, but I'll say something nice about him now. You know, when you look at, uh, you go to the, uh, I, I don't know if they're still doing these, but if you used to go to the, the popular fiction racks in the drugstore or whatever, you'd see all these Tom Clancy books like Splinter Cell and Op Cell and um, Tom Clancy's this, Tom Clancy's that. And, you know, it was rumored even that later in his career, after his first couple books, he didn't even really write the, the Jack Ryan books. But he definitely didn't write any of these books. And and I assumed that people knew that, you know, those, those ops and those kind of counterterrorism quickie books, which are probably good, but, you know, and they, and they have, it's, it would say like Tom Clancy's Splinter Cell. And then at the bottom, there would be the name of a writer on the cover, written by Steve Pizzix or somebody like that. It was the only name I remember, I think, of that group. He wrote some Star Trek novels and some other things too, but, oh, this is going on a lot longer than I thought. Uh, so, you know, he was very, you know, and this is while, while Tom, Can Tom Clancy was alive. He was very willing to sell his name. And, I mean, and it has to be, you know, I thought about that in terms, and Asimov he did this for a while, uh, late in his career too. Where he, there was a series called Isaac Asimov's Robot City, which was kind of licensing Asimov's name and the concept of robots, but they're written by other people. And I hear some of those are pretty good, you know, but they're just they're just using a, a more famous name to to sell books and hiring other people to write the books. I, I did know this guy who was a, a captain in the Marines who thought all these books were written by Tom Clancy, though, because he, he found out I like to read. And it was a guy I worked with for a while. He was a, he just got back from the first Gulf, or not the first Gulf War, good God, the, the, last, the, George, the Bush Jr.'s Gulf War. Um, And he's like, oh yeah, I, I like I like uh, Tom Clan Tom Clancy's really good. You ever read him? Like I hadn't, but those his books, those Jack Ryan books are pretty good. But those those Splinter Cell books are really good. Those are the best thing he writes. I'm like, you know, he doesn't write those, right? 
Wait, what do you mean? His name's on him. You know, his name's big. It, you know, he's and this guy didn't read enough that he really cared who actually typed, who wrote the stories and that. But it occurred to me that if Tom Clancy got that kind of deal, he didn't create that deal. Maybe he did. But those big writers must get offered that kind of stuff all the time. That's why now I come back to Stephen King, where I thought Stephen King must be offered that, or at least back when they were, when they were pumping out uh, pocket paperbacks for drugstores, must have been offered. You know, you could see it like Stephen King's Haunted House, written by, you know, uh, I forgot the name of every single writer, horror writer of that era now. You know, where Stephen King could come up with some hinky concept or Stephen King's vampires and like written 20 Salem's Lot ripoff books, uh, you know, just selling under his name. So you just, my point is, you just never know who's, who's being taken care of by their estate and who's not and who's willing to just do anything for a buck and who's not. Um, and that's what I think about now when I think about those Sprague de Camp and, and Carter book and Lynn Carter books. Because I really think they're just so unlike El Sprague de Camp's own work, where he has a sense of humor. The one thing I will say about this, Conan the Liberator, the last chapter is, is by far the best chapter because Conan becomes the king. I'll spoil it for you. Um, Steve Donahue did a good video on, the, on this same one which I was like finally able to watch. I've been waiting to watch it for days till I finished this book, but Conan, at the, at the end, he becomes the king of Aquilonia, and uh, the last few uh, pages of the book are hilarious because it's like all these ministers going, okay, like, let's look at the taxes, let's look at the, <laughs> let's, let's look at the resources and all this, and, and Conan is like, it doesn't think this is funny at all. It's a funny way to end the book is that they've got this guy who's like the mighty Conan who gave them their, you know, destroyed the tyrant and freed the people. He's the liberator of Aquiloni. He's going to rule in peace and everything. And then there's just like all this bureaucracy he's going to have to deal with. So that was funny. That was more like the kind of stuff you get in an actual Lynn Carter novel or short story. Um, and you don't get much of that in these books, and you don't get anything really to replace it. They didn't really work that hard to, and they probably wouldn't have been able to do it anyway, they, um, to try and uh, respect Howard's artistry. So I had to, I had to, I had to flush that out of my system, so I read Black Claw. I just picked a random uh, Conan story um, that I knew I would like that I hadn't read in a while, which is m normally how I read them. I'll read all, you know, whenever I have like a, a short reading period, like 20 minutes or half an hour, or whatever. I'll go, oh, I, I should read Red Nails, or I should read Tower of the Elephant, or I should read The Frost Trench Daughter. Those are probably the three I've reread the most, but I hadn't read Black Colossus in a long time, which turned out to be a good pick to flush this out because it's a similar story. I don't have, a, I didn't get a cover of it. I was going to download, see if I could find the original Weird Tales. Um, but it's one where, where Conan starts out as a mercenary and then he's hired by this queen, or uh, would you call her a queen or a princess? Anyway, uh, he, he's, he's promoted to head of her army because he's obviously the most competent soldier. So it was, it was a kind of a campaign story as well, where, where he raises in status, and it's, you know, it's only like 30 pages or something. But it's just, it's, it's, his world is, is so, so full and rich. You feel like you're there. It's very opulent. And uh, that's the one thing they didn't manage to capture in those the camp and... Lynn Carter books, and I'm, I've read a few of the others. I read a few, here and there. I've read a couple of Robert Jordans. I think I've got some others. I think by Roland Green or somebody somewhere. I might try those, but uh, I'm sure they're going to be fun. But you know, Howard is really like on another level, and I don't really know if. El Spring to Camp under appreciated that.
I think they thought he was a great adventure writer and he came up with a great premise and a great character that they could easily expand on. I mean, I, I remember once I tried to read Conan and the Spider God by L. Sprague Camp alone, and there was I couldn't even finish that book. So Conan the Liberator, I did finish uh, this. I was going to do a separate video on that, but this has gone on so long, I might as well talk about it here instead. But some of the ways that booktube has changed my reading is i would have never finished conan the liberator i would probably fit i would have probably read the first third of it and and thought screw this but i i did want to talk about it so i felt i had to read the whole thing so i am reading more books more bad books in a way because of youtube thank you very much booktube uh, i don't have to obviously it's, i'm just joking about that that you know because i do want to talk about stuff and i don't want to just be in this channel like uh, this book's dumb I read one chapter it's dumb I'm not going to read it here's this other book that you all like it's dumb because uh, I did so I have been giving books more of a chance than ever um, I have to think about more about how that's working out the next book I read this kind of goes along with pastiches too so I'll, I'll cover it here briefly and I've talked about Nicholas Mayer a lot on this channel. Sherlock Holmes and the Telegram from Hell, which is a Sherlock Holmes novel. The first one that he's put the, the, the name Sherlock Holmes in his title, it's usually The Adventure of This or That. 7% Solution, The Canary Trainer, or The Adventure of the Peerless. Oh, no. That's Jose Farmer, uh, Wold Newton, The Adventure of the Peerless Peer. That's his pastiche novel. Um... Sherlock Holmes meets uh, Lord Greystoke, I believe, but without naming everybody. Anyway, this is, uh, this uh, time-wise, this would be the, the very last Sherlock Holmes story. It's the latest that Nicholas Meyer wrote, and it takes place two years after his last bow, which takes, his last bow is when the last home story is published, which takes place right at the beginning of World War I, 1914. This take, starts in 1916. If you know about um, history, I won't spoil it for you, but if you know about history of World War I, you might guess what the telegram is going to be. I liked some of his others better. Um, this one is so festooned with, with uh, historical figures. Um, so much so that it's got like photographs all through the text of different people, you know, of Lord Melville, of, of the first quote unquote M, of real life M of the British Secret Service. Um, different people, J. Edgar Hoover is a young man. It just goes on and on. They go all over. They start in Britain, they go to Washington, D.C., they go to uh, South America, Mexico, you know, and it almost had too, too many uh, real-life historical references, mostly in the military, obviously, since it's a World War I novel story, which I'm not that versed on history, so I really had to, had to depend lean on the notes and the afterword and all that to see who all these people were supposed to be. So it probably didn't work as well for me. Some of his other books, like like The Canary Trainer, which was kind of set in the world of Phantom of the Opera, or The West End Horror, which is set in, in British theater and involves uh, Oscar Wilde and Bram Stoker and people I know, I'm more familiar with. So... It, it it was good. It wasn't my favorite one. And here's another case of, you know, I might have put this aside if I wasn't doing it for the channel. And just thought, well, I'll read this some other day and then not get to it. But I thought I'd mention it here because I'm talking about pastiches. I still overall think Nicholas Mayer is an uh, excellent Holmes pastiche writer. Uh, he's done some really fun stuff. Probably one of my favorites. My most favorite Holmes pastiche... Well, the Anthony Horowitz ones are, are good. At least one of them is. The Moriarty one isn't so good. It'll make you pull your hair out if you have hair. At least it did me. That's why I have to shave my head now. 
because my hair hurts so much from after the little trick Mr. Horowitz paid up, played on us in his Moriarty book, uh, which he played fair, but it was still. And uh, but overall, I think my my favorite Holmes pastiche book, unless you want to count Solar Ponds, the August Derwith novels, which brings us back to Lovecraft, which brings us almost back to Howard. Um, which which I like a lot. I like those Solar Pond stories a lot. Um, was Lauren Estelman's Sherlock Holmes versus Dracula. I think that's a really good book. A really good Holmes book. Anyway, I'm probably done with uh, Sumerian September now. Uh, maybe I'll read a couple. I got. I have to invest in a in a, in a full complete Robert Howard Conan collection, and I'd also maybe like to get the El Borak. Uh, collection too because I enjoyed Michael Kivon's video discussing the flame knife which is a story in one of the Conan pastiche books that was which DeCamp rewrote from a El Borak Howard adventure story so now I want to read those El Borak stories um but the Conan, the collection I have is like an old cheapy one, two ninety nine or ninety nine or something that I thought had all the, at least all the early weird, weird tale stories, the original eighteen or so that were published in his lifetime. But it only has like eight of them. And one of them is Aaron the Dragon, which is the novel. So I do want to get a full, a, a full, the full three volume set from. I think it's Delray. Whoever does it now, uh, I think those are about twelve bucks each in ebook. Though it's like forty bucks for ebook for three ebooks, but maybe maybe the library has them. Maybe I won't do it. You know, there's so much, so much to read. I've actually have been reading some other non-genre stuff, which is really good too. And I'll talk about that in my next video. Who knows when that'll be?